In the 1990s, Seattle, Washington was plagued by hundreds of bank robberies. Most of the thieves were caught, but one continued to elude the FBI. Wearing a disguise, he stole millions, threatening to kill anyone who got in his way. With no leads and little evidence, agents feared the only way to stop him was to catch him in the act. Every bank teller's worst fear is to stare down the barrel of a robber's gun. Banks use a variety of devices to discourage would-be robbers. Security cameras, silent alarms, and exploding die packs. But when an elusive bank robber targeted Seattle's banks, none of these precautions were effective. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It would take cunning, precision, and patience to capture a master of disguise. The FBI knew only as Hollywood. Seattle, Washington, 1992. The computer revolution was growing. Technology entrepreneurs were pumping billions into the city's economy. To accommodate the newfound wealth, banks opened branches all over Seattle. But neighborhood convenience also meant more opportunity for theft. On the afternoon of June 25th, at Seafirst Bank's Madison branch, two masked gunmen threatened to shoot anyone who did not comply with their demands. One trained his gun on the frightened customers, while the other forced a teller to empty her cash drawer. After the bag was filled, they demanded car keys from one of the customers who they had watched full up. They warned the tellers not to hit an alarm or they would return and kill someone. The two sped away with nearly $20,000. Since the bank's deposits were insured by the federal government, the FBI was called in to assist the Seattle police. One in the front, one in the back. Because no alarm had been tripped, the bank's security cameras were not activated. Investigators had no photos of the suspects. Customers and bank employees described the gunman as being of medium height and build. One employee heard the man holding the cash call to his partner using the name Mark. The guy came to that door. The robbers had worn gloves, so no fingerprints could be obtained. Investigators attempted to lift shoe prints from a desk where one of them had stood. Partial treads were recovered, which investigators believed were made by sneakers. Agents recorded the license plate number of the customer's stolen car, a Cadillac sedan. Hours later, the stolen Cadillac was discovered abandoned in a neighborhood close to the bank. Forensic technicians would pore over the vehicle's interior, but find no fingerprints, hairs, or fibers foreign to the car. Seven weeks passed with no leads. Then, on Friday, August 14th, this is a robbery. Everybody the down, same bank down. was robbed again. Though the thief struck alone wearing a new disguise, one of the tellers believed it was the same man. He appeared to be wearing theatrical makeup. We didn't trip off any alarms. 
fill that up. His take was more than $8,000, and it was just the beginning. Over the next three months, the same man hit four more Seattle area banks. Each time, a solo gunman wearing theater makeup, a hat, and dark sunglasses was responsible. He brandished a Glock 9mm pistol and threatened to kill anyone who tried to stop him. On his sixth robbery, the thief had gotten away with $252,000, and investigators still had no leads and no name. Special Agent Sean Johnson of the FBI's Seattle field office began tracking this master of disguise, who had come to be known as Hollywood. It's much easier to coin a name for somebody than call him a tall white male in a blue hat. So uh, with this person in particular, he wore, once again, this elaborate facial disguise, makeup. Uh, so somewhere along the line, somebody started calling him Hollywood because of that, and that name stuck with him. Hollywood had gone silent since he'd robbed Seafirst Bank's Hawthorne branch in northeast Seattle. His take from that location exceeded a quarter of a million dollars. To date, Hollywood had grabbed over $320,000 from Seattle area banks. Authorities had recovered none of the stolen cash, and they still had no clues to his identity. As the months passed, investigators wondered if he had quit or moved on to another city. Then, on November 24th, 1993, just over a year since his last heist, Hollywood struck again. Brandishing his trademark Glock pistol, Hollywood herded the customers together. Don't move. Come on in. He returned to Seafirst Bank's Hawthorne branch, the bank he had previously hit for more than a quarter million dollars. He asked for the reserve cash. Unsatisfied with the cash drawer take, he ordered a teller to let him into the vault in a back room. Hollywood emerged with nearly $100,000. Again, he threatened to kill anyone who hit an alarm. No one disobeyed his orders. When Hollywood came into the banks, he was very much in control. He was polite to a degree, but it didn't make people comfortable. Uh, they were very afraid that he would use the weapon. He brandished it. It actually pointed at a number of people during the course of the robberies. So we knew that uh, he was not afraid uh, to show the weapon and also to possibly use that weapon against somebody who didn't uh, obey what he told them to do. Security strategies in Seattle banks at this time included using marked bills to trace stolen money. Another tactic was dye packs. Hidden inside a stack of bills, the packs contain red dye and an electronic charge. The pack detonates and stains a thief when he crosses sensors at the bank's exit. Silent alarms made it possible for tellers to call the police without alerting the robbers. Video cameras monitored every corner of the bank. So far, Hollywood had somehow managed to defeat all these measures. July 13th, 1994. Hollywood attacked his 10th bank in two years. He used a stun gun to threaten bank employees. A teller risked her life pushing a silent alarm. Hollywood looted the cash drawer, unaware that patrol units were racing to the scene. Shut up! And don't touch anybody! You know, any pretty, don't touch anybody! Go! No. 
He fled with nearly $112,000. A witness outside the bank saw him get into a dark blue Dodge Caravan. The second person drove it. The witness was unable to see the vehicle's license tag. After police secured the scene, another bank employee arrived for work. He told police about an incident on the previous day. The employee noticed a man taking notes in front of the bank, standing next to a blue Dodge caravan. The witness said he was too far away to get a good look at his face. I appreciate you coming forward. If you can think of any other details. To Agent Johnson, it appeared that Hollywood studied the locations before striking. He would uh, uh, scout out the banks uh, days before get a feel for the layout, uh, who came, who went uh, from the bank at given times. Hollywood's planning was paying off. He had gotten away with over $660,000. He struck most often on Wednesdays or Thursdays. The next time he appeared was six months later. As he filled his bag, the teller overheard a radio call from beneath his coat urging him to exit. When he passed the bank's sensors, a dye pack exploded. For the first time, he had failed in a robbery attempt. A witness outside the bank took down the license plate number of the getaway car. Special Agent Johnson was able to trace the vehicle. We ran the license plates from the cars, and they came back to uh, a couple who lived in Tacoma, Washington, uh, south of Seattle. So I went and talked to uh, the couple to find out how their car had been sold. They had advertised the car in a local paper. The buyer paid $1,200 in cash without test driving it. The couple described the buyer as a white male in his late 30s or early 40s, of medium height and weight. Based on their description, a sketch artist created a likeness of the suspect. The FBI now had their first glimpse of what Hollywood might look like. By the spring of 1995, a masked Seattle gunman had robbed 12 banks of nearly a million dollars and left behind few clues. Investigators dubbed him Hollywood for his use of disguises and theatrical makeup. The only lead that agents had was a sketch of what they believed was the face behind the mask. Special Agent Sean Johnson looked for a pattern. If he could figure out similarities among the banks Hollywood robbed, perhaps he could predict when and where he would strike next. I went back uh, and visited all the banks that Hollywood had hit since June of 92. What I was looking for was some commonality. How many doors were in the banks? What was the layout of the lobby? Where was the vault located? Was it downstairs, upstairs, on the main floor? What was the size of the parking lot? Was it adjacent to the bank? Was it across the street? Uh, what kind of street was this bank located on? Johnson discovered that most of the banks were in commercial districts where area businesses made their deposits. The banks also bordered residential areas. This enabled Hollywood to blend into the surrounding neighborhood without arousing suspicion. He liked uh, three areas of the city primarily, uh, the northeast part of town, Madison Park, which is just outside of downtown, and West Seattle. So uh, once again, looking at the types of banks he hit, the branches uh, themselves and areas of the city, we came up with a uh, pattern of uh, likely targets. In March of 1995, three years after Hollywood's initial heist, the Puget Sound Violent Crimes Task Force was formed. 
Staffed with investigators from five different agencies, they had one goal in mind, to take Hollywood off the streets. Hollywood struck most often around noon and almost always on the last three days of the work week. Four of his past five robberies occurred in late January or early February. Agents calculated that Hollywood appeared to be going through about $20,000 a month. They figured he had enough cash to last through the end of the year. Agent Johnson predicted that Hollywood wouldn't strike until the end of January. Seattle detective Mike McGann joined the task force in June of 1995. McGann knew the streets and had many bank robbery callers to his credit. It was my belief that at least 95% of the people that I arrested were narcotics users. The other 5% I believed to be gamblers, thrill seekers, professionals, or people that were working out of sheer desperation. Where I'd classify Hollywood was that he was a well-trained, well-disciplined professional. McGann poured over the security camera photos of Hollywood. He noted the weapons he brandished were a 9mm Glock and a stun gun. At the time, these arms were being considered as weapons of choice among law enforcement. The detective also noticed that Hollywood indexed his trigger finger on the side of the 9mm, a technique taught to police officers. Many of the robberies occurred in the late morning, between 11 a.m. and noon, precisely the time when a shift change for the Seattle police occurred. The evidence pointed to a frightening possibility. Hollywood might be a cop. And the reason I, I thought he was a police officer is he knew so much about how we operated, that he was probably watching us or listening to us, uh, he had, uh, he was disciplined, he uh, was in and out of the banks quickly, he moved swiftly, he, he just knew a lot about the, the policy procedures of the bank, he knew that the, the areas that he was hitting in were primarily uh, you know, residential areas that don't have much police presence in them. Then something else caught his eye. He noticed that Hollywood was wearing a radio on his belt. If Hollywood was communicating with a walkie, perhaps police could intercept the transmission. The detective contacted an electronics expert known as the Glitch. With his help, McGann hoped to gain an advantage. I had sat down with this person and showed him the uh, sur surveillance photographs of Hollywood and the two-way radio he had, and he was able to determine the frequency most common to those radios that he would work off, and it was two different frequencies. The glitch offered to rig up a scanner in McGann's unmarked car. By eavesdropping on Hollywood, investigators hoped they could pinpoint his whereabouts and catch him in the act. The idea didn't work. Special Agent Johnson was stationed outside a bank in northeast Seattle monitoring the radio when Hollywood and an accomplice struck elsewhere. It's about 11.30. Uh, I was going to break off about uh, 12 o'clock, and all of a sudden I heard the Seattle police radio saying we've had a bank robbery, First Interstate Bank, and that was about two miles from my location. I heard the physical description. I knew at that point it was Hollywood and he'd come back on one of those three days I predicted a year before, and we just missed him. A bystander outside the bank got the license number. Like his first robbery, the getaway car was found in a neighborhood near the bank. The FBI traced the car back to its owner, who said he had sold it to a man for cash a few weeks earlier. 
I had the uh, owner come up and look at the vehicle and I said, is there anything different about this car from when you sold it? And he said, sure. Overall condition of your uh, engine compartment here is anything. The owner noticed the car had a new battery. Agents found that the car had been wiped down inside and out. The owner also noticed that two of the tires had been replaced with newer ones. So I went to trace the, the tires, found out they'd been bought uh, in Tacoma, Washington. The battery had been bought at a Sears store in Tacoma about two days after the car was purchased. So I knew at that point that uh, these people, whether it was Hollywood and or his partners, were uh, in the area at least two months before the robberies. Working with a sketch artist, the owner described the buyer. Investigators now had two composite sketches, but they were still no closer to catching Hollywood. Supervisory Special Agent Ellen Glasser was brought in to head the task force. She made the decision to go on the offensive. It's one thing to put pen to paper and to put your thought processes at work and try to solve a case. It's another when you take a proactive posture in an investigation knowing that you might get into a confrontation with somebody like Hollywood. The supervisor realized that a more aggressive stance would place her agents in greater peril. Hollywood had repeatedly threatened to kill anyone who tried to stop him. We knew he had a propensity for violence and figured that if he was going to these elaborate means to disguise himself to plan the robberies, that he probably would not uh, necessarily give up easily as most others did and we were concerned about uh, safety of law enforcement and safety of customers and employees of the banks. Okay, he's taking a lot of More personnel were assigned to specific that, areas of the city uh, targeting the banks hit most often by Hollywood. So he came up with a game plan saying okay we're gonna be out on the streets on Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays between these periods of time uh, knowing full well that uh, uh, greed would probably take the better part of Hollywood and he would come back and rob another bank, even with the amount of money he'd already taken. On May 22, 1996, despite the increased presence of law enforcement, Hollywood hit the first interstate bank in the affluent suburb of Madison Park. It was his 14th known robbery. To generate leads, agents reached out to the community. We increased the reward to $50,000 that we were offering in the community for tips. We didn't want to have the media work against us. Now, we didn't want to glamorize Hollywood and, and cause copycat bank robbers to, to go out and, and rob banks. But we also felt that we needed the public. Agents saturated Madison Park with hundreds of wanted flyers. Perhaps heightened public awareness could also help eliminate that neighborhood as a potential target. Then, law enforcement could increase manpower in the remaining neighborhoods. The campaign yielded nothing. Hollywood had not surfaced in months. They consulted a police profiler to learn how Hollywood might react if and when he was cornered. Could be someone who is familiar or someone who is taken out of Based on his broad knowledge of violent criminal behavior, the profiler told them that Hollywood would not go quietly. And it was very important for us to hear him say, this guy is going to resist arrest. This guy will not want to go into custody. This guy will fight you. This guy is dangerous. Authorities could only guess when and where Hollywood would strike next, and if his gun would remain silent. For almost four years, Hollywood had threatened to shoot anyone who got in his way. Agents were convinced that if he was challenged, the masked gunman would shoot to kill. By 1996, a masked gunman known only as Hollywood had robbed 14 Seattle banks. 
He threatened to kill dozens of people for his take of $1.2 million over four years. Though Hollywood had not fired his weapon, agents believed that if confronted, he would kill. Supervisory Special Agent Ellen Glasser showed the task force a videotape of what could happen if they were not prepared. We have been using for training in the FBI a video of the tragic firefight that took place in 1986 in Miami where we lost two of our agents and several other agents were wounded. What they were doing that day is they were on a surveillance for two dangerous bank robbery suspects. So there were some obvious parallels to what we were doing. On April 11, 1986, the FBI confronted two armed bank robbers in Miami. A shootout erupted. The gunmen advanced while the agents were reloading their revolvers killing two of them and seriously wounding five others. That Miami shootout was a reminder of how high the stakes were. We can't always be 100% prepared, but we should be thinking. Have a plan. All right, come on. Set. Let me... To avoid repeating the tragedy that occurred in Miami, Glasser developed more uniform procedures between the various agencies. The Seattle SWAT team trained alongside Special Agent Johnson. We did extensive training with them, uh, firearms training, uh, felony car stops, uh, how to take people out of cars, uh, different situations and how we'd respond to a bank robbery that Hollywood had committed. Uh, and that was all done under uh, Ellen Glasser's uh, supervision. And her number one concern, of course, was the safety of all the people involved. Yeah. FBI, get out, get out, get out! Detective McGann knew they needed to make sure all personnel were on the same page. It also gave us a chance to test our communications because the FBI doesn't work off uh, police communications. They had their own. So what we had to do is, is get everybody on board on the same radio frequency. To prevent the danger of friendly fire, all personnel were required to wear clothing with emblazoned logos. As Thanksgiving approached, Glasser believed they were as prepared as they could be. Well, that Wednesday, that day before Thanksgiving in 1996, it started out just like any other day. I went to work thinking I was going to catch up on some of my overdue paperwork, thinking that I was looking forward to the holiday the next day, having a day off, the banks would be closed, and thinking that people needed a rest because they had been working so hard. Agent Glasser, Detective McGann, and Detective Pete Erickson were the last ones in the office when an alert tone came over the radio at 541. And upon hearing that, I knew that it was Hollywood that had hit. And I'm looking around the office thinking, well, Pete's here. And I looked at him and said, do you want to go? He goes, oh, yeah, let's go. And Ellen saw me run down the hall, and she's yelling, Mike, what's going on? I said, Hollywood hit. Do you want to go? She goes, yes. So she grabbed her coat, and we all left the task force office. And my car was parked right outside the front door. We ran down. and turned on the lights and, and the siren and put the light on the roof and away we went. Multiple suspects had robbed a bank in Lake City, the Seattle suburb just minutes from task force headquarters. As soon as we got into Mike's car, I could hear the Seattle police radio traffic. And I remember hearing the references to the makeup. And it was really those references to the pancake makeup that, that made it resonate in my head that this was it. This was it. They got another call. A witness had seen a vehicle exit the bank's parking lot in an erratic manner. A vehicle matching the description had been spotted.
The police believed they had found the getaway car. It turned out to be a false alarm. The engine was cold. 20 minutes had passed since the first call. McGann was sure that Hollywood had transferred to a different vehicle by now. He would need a place to change. He would need a place to take that makeup off, that wig off, to change his clothing, uh, to put the weapons, you know, so put the weapons away or the money. The getaway car there would most likely be a van. Detective McGann continued to cruise the side streets in the residential area near the bank. From past robberies, McGann and Agent Glasser knew this was where he would most likely change vehicles. Some units were responding to one location, and Mike was saying, that's not him, that's not him. He'd patrolled in these streets. He'd grown up in Seattle. He knew every nook and cranny of the town in that area. After several minutes of crisscrossing the main roads, they pulled up behind a white van. And there was condensation on the insides of the windows. I mean, heavy condensation where the, the beads of water were dripping down on the insides of the van. But there were flashlights moving about the van, real quick light, and it had dark windows, tinted windows on it. McGann had a strong suspicion it was Hollywood. They called in to check the plates. The driver of the van ignored the emergency lights and pulled away. Dispatch. Vehicle one. The investigators had no way of knowing how many persons were in the van, or if they had any weapons. If it was Hollywood, they knew at the very least he would be carrying a 9mm Glock. By this time, I knew he knew we were behind him. He could see me. He, he just knew we were there. And he drove northbound and slowly came to a stop. They prepared to approach the idling van. Good! When I got out, all I saw was this person holding the rifle at port arms and stepped out from the side and took aim at me with that rifle. And right then I feared that I was gonna be shot and killed. The rifle jammed. McGann fired into the rear of the van. The chase had turned into a firefight. Right, get in, get in, get in. On the night before Thanksgiving 1996, three investigators had just fired at a fleeing van after its driver had attempted to shoot them with a rifle. They believe the van held a man known only as Hollywood, an elusive bank robber. Special Agent Sean Johnson responded to the call for backup. My pager went off. I looked at it and knew immediately there had been a bank robbery. Uh, I called the office and was told that uh, uh, Hollywood, uh, based on the description that they had gotten, Hollywood had just robbed a bank, Seafirst Bank, uh, Lake City Branch, in the north part of town. Still several miles away, Johnson raced to the location. As the van came to another stop, backup arrived. The gunman ducked back into the van and the chase resumed. 
Special Agent Glasser felt it was a miracle the three of them had survived unharmed. I think that's partially by the grace of God because these, these rounds were found in the windshield of the car that was behind us, so they went right over us. They continued to pursue the unidentified gunman through the residential neighborhood. The agent updated their new position for approaching units. They followed the van until it disappeared around a turn. Fearful he might be driving into an ambush, McGann got out and continued the pursuit on foot. Detective McGann told a canine officer to cover the right side while he moved up on the left. And I'm trying to think, am I doing everything right? I'm alive, there's no bullet holes in me, my coworkers are alive, plenty of help is behind us. And I knew plenty of the help was in front of us, coming at us. Up ahead, they could see the lights from an approaching Seattle police cruiser. It intercepted the van, forcing it off the road. The van had come to rest in the front yard of a house. Investigators still had no idea how many were in the vehicle. All right. The side doors burst open, but no one came out. Two men, badly wounded, were pulled from the van. One suspect had taken three rounds. The bullets had penetrated his left shoulder, thigh, and stomach. The other had been hit in his right shoulder. When I looked down at him and said, what's your name? And he said, Steve. I said, Steve what? And he said, Steve Myers. And I said, are you Hollywood? And he says, no. The other suspect was taller and heavier than the gunman from the security camera photos. Police believed he was not Hollywood either. The detective turned his attention to the van. But no one else was inside. And I'm thinking, where's the third suspect? You're saying the suspect got out. Are you positive? And they're saying, yes, he got out when he saw us. He took off. So I'm thinking, oh, my God. Investigators quickly organized a search, both on the ground and in the air. A third suspect, probably Hollywood, was on the run. Police believed he was armed. They did not know how far he could get if he was wounded. As the search continued, a forensics team processed the van. And in the back of the van, there was a guitar case that had been converted into a gun carrying case and a blue nylon bag that, that had money in it. And it was a, a big bag of money. The robbers had left behind more than a million dollars. They also found pieces of a latex mask, most likely belonging to Hollywood. Scattered around the blood-soaked interior, investigators found an assault rifle, a semi-automatic shotgun, two pistols, and several boxes of ammunition. Hollywood's Glock 9mm pistol was nowhere to be found. Could have taken hostage in a house, yeah. I, that did cross my mind that, you know, maybe he ran into a house and was holding a family hostage and would hold them until, you know, the early hours of the morning or traffic, until traffic died out, or he could be watching us. He could be one of us. 
Wherever he was and whoever he was, Hollywood had eluded the FBI once more. After four years of pursuit, the masked bank robber known as Hollywood had eluded capture again following his 15th known bank robbery. But two of his accomplices had been taken into custody. One was identified as Mark Biggins. Biggins had been Hollywood's accomplice in three of the robberies, including their first. He wore the Reagan mask. The other accomplice was Steve Myers, the man who drove Hollywood's getaway cars. Special Agent Johnson pressed Myers for Hollywood's real name. You need to tell me uh, who this person is, where he is. Uh, and he finally said, OK, I'll tell you. Uh, the person you're looking for is uh, Scott Skurlock. Scott Skurlock wasn't a police officer. He was a local actor. Agents moved in on his 20-acre ranch in Olympia, Washington, an hour south of Seattle. But no one was there. Investigators found a semi-automatic 9mm Glock. Agents recovered $23,000 in cash. The searchers also found a dozen pairs of canvas athletic shoes, the same kind that Hollywood was reported to have worn in several robberies. Behind the house, agents approached a barn. Inside, they found tools, building materials, and equipment. On the dusty floor, one of the agents noticed some footprints that led to a trap door. It opened into an underground chamber. See light switch anywhere? Agents had no way of knowing if Hollywood was hiding there with a gun. Skurlock wasn't there. But behind the curtain, they discovered a second room. It was a complete makeup studio. The agents also found a photograph of Skurlock without makeup. Behind the barn, Special Agent Sean Johnson and his team came across a large treehouse. It sat about 60 feet up into the trees. It was built on seven cedar trees. Uh, it consisted of three stories. It had numerous ramps that uh, extended out from the treehouse. It was uh, something to behold. Agents searched the treehouse. They found no sign of Skurlock. Police were still patrolling the neighborhood where the shootout had occurred the night before. Searchers had combed the area, but found no trace of the fugitive. Then a report came in that a man had spotted someone hiding in a camper behind his mother's house. Trailer. Police responded and approached the camper. Sir, police officer, come out of the trailer. They identified themselves, but received no response. An officer emptied a can of pepper spray into the window. Police, come out of the trailer. A shot rang out. Steve, get back 
police set up a perimeter around the camper and called in reinforcements. Agent Johnson had just returned from searching Skirlock's property. Within minutes of arriving at the office, uh, having not even unloaded any evidence, I heard on the Seattle police radio uh, shots had been exchanged at a location about two blocks away from the, the previous night's events. So without even uh, 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 beginning to unload the evidence, I took off again, heading northbound uh, out of town, uh, lights and sirens to this uh, location. Every available unit converged on the site. Supervisory Special Agent Glasser had gone home after the shootout. By that point in time, I had decided not to cook a turkey on Thanksgiving. I had changed the reservations for where we were going to eat Thanksgiving to a later time so that we could all be together as a family. And we were almost out the door um, when we got a call from the office that Hollywood was barricaded in a trailer. No other shots had been fired since that first exchange. Skirlock's girlfriend was brought to the scene. If it was the fugitive, perhaps she could persuade him to give himself up. There was no response. Nobody knew for sure who was in the camper. Out of options, the SWAT team was called to action. Hoping to flush out the suspect, they fired two rounds of tear gas into his refuge. They heard nothing. SWAT members entered cautiously. And the initial radio communication from the SWAT team said there's lots of blood, uh, but we see no body. And I, my first reaction to that was, is this guy a ghost or what? How can there be no body? And then just seconds later, they say, we've, we've got a body. Through the smoke, a white male could be seen lying lifeless on the floor. A gun near his head. Skirlock's photograph was compared to the body. It matched. The coroner later determined that his death had been self-inflicted. Mark Biggins recovered from his wounds. He and Steve Myers pled guilty to bank robbery, assault on a federal officer, and firearms violations. They were sentenced to 21 years in a federal prison. Scott Skurlock had hidden behind a mask for four and a half years. But when the FBI struck back, the man they called Hollywood found there was no place left to hide. <laughs> 